Okay, so next we have um, occupational health, future challenges and solutions, and Roel is gonna be speaking about that. Um, thank you very much. It's uh, great to um, be able to speak today about uh, occupational health within uh, this meeting. Um, Annette Peters this morning already presented on uh, Richard Gold 2, where officially the occupational health was basically already mentioned as, as one of the topics, but we really thought it would be good to talk a little bit more specific about occupational health, what are the challenges and solutions that we see. Um, this is basically work that I present on behalf of the, the working group, which uh, was Manolis Kojivinas, uh, Ingrid Malem, Good Strife, Neil Pierce, who is here, Michelle Turner, and uh, Maria Albin. Uh, but next to this, um, I really want to thank um, everybody of, of OmegaNet, who really was um, essential for actually getting all the information and all the inputs, uh, but also the EPCO community, who has given uh, very valuable input. Um, when we talk about environmental um, priorities, you can ask why, why are we talking about occupation? Um, and just basically, I mean, a simple answer is, of course, if we just look at our daily lives uh, and a working life, um, a significant part of the day we actually spend um, at work. So this is the classical uh, 888 division that we, we have. But of course, um, it's not only that um, we are spending a long time there, but it's also often that occupation and environmental situations are very much connected. We have occupations that actually happen in the general environment, so this kind of division and siloing does not help. Um, thirdly, um, we have seen that many uh, occupational settings have actually um, resulted in knowledge that we actually now use and how we understand environmental risk factors. And so we have used those as natural experiments, as we would say, where high exposures occurred, we have seen the first indications of certain diseases popping up that later on were confirmed in the general environment. And so that's why it's really important to focus on occupational health. Um, as I said, um, we spend a long time at, at work, um, but we also have to recognize that there have been profound changes in the way that we actually work over the last century. Um, if you see here on the left side, these are basically um, uh, machine operators uh, around the 1900s. Um, that's a machine operator, um, how somebody works nowadays, and there's a world of difference. It also means a world of differences about occupational risk factors, about um, social pay and other things. But we also have completely different jobs that we didn't have. We were talking about e-commerce today, ordering online, and everybody that this comes by to bring our goods and food. Um, so this is one of the food deliveries that uh, you might see basically showing up. So we have really new jobs, new job arrangements that we didn't have before. The third one, I think, is a really important one, and that is that if we look at the occupational field, um, there has been very little coordination um, in Europe around occupational health that hasn't really come together for a long time. Luckily, we now have OmegaNet and a few other um, endeavors that are trying to do that more, uh, but this really has been a, a problem until now. And that has basically um, caused problems in, in Europe if we think about health. Um, just showing you here that um, that basically led that some of the old risks always remained, and here you can see Basically, um, train repairs uh, where we have Chrome 6 in the paints that were used in the past, and so we still are dealing with risk factors that we already knew for a long time, but still persist basically in the occupational arena. Uh, but because we are not well organized, we also bring back risks that we already knew and had basically thought that we had on the, perhaps on the control for part, but don't. Um, the other example here on top. Due to the lights, it's difficult to see, but this is basically um, composite countertops that we have in the kitchens, which actually brought back silica problems into the workplace that we thought that we actually had basically recognized. 
Uh, but it also means that we don't recognize new risks that are occurring that we recognize too late. And I'll just give an example, basically now, one of the topics that we are dealing with, basically, this irregular work, working at night, circumstances that we don't know exactly what that does to, basically, physical and mental health. Uh, but it also has a lot to do with migrant workers and underrepresented populations where we don't know what the health risks are. And that's basically uh, because we haven't been that organized and didn't have a consolidated research agenda that we worked on. And that basically means that a large section of the European population and globally um, basically do not reach their maximum health potential because of these issues that we haven't addressed, haven't covered. Within HERA, um, we basically um, were within RG2. Um, that's where, where it was hosted by, um, as everybody else, they always think that they don't fit in a box, and that's also true for occupational health. So if you uh, look at it, it actually has connections to chemicals and physical exposures, as was already elegantly presented this morning. It has to do with research infrastructures that we have heard about, but it also has to do with climate change and, and changing job circumstances. So there's a lot of connections to the other research goals where occupations is important. Um, after um, long deliberations and inputs with stakeholders, we, we ended up with, with six categories, and I will just briefly um, go through these six research needs that we have highlighted in this report, but for food detail, please, please read the report uh, very carefully. We think that one of the research needs that we really have is about climate change and how that affects occupational health, but also the regulations of the EU uh, about key enabling technologies, which is about AI, novel manufacturing, novel materials, how that actually affects occupational health um, and as part of the Green Deal. The second research need has to do with these changing and aging workforce, which I will come back to later. But of course, we have the demographics of the European population changing, and that means that basically the demographics of the work population is changing, and what does that do to occupational health? We have working time issues, where we all know that um, working becomes more irregular. That's always wrong for a more scientific crowd, which I think always works quite irregular, but it is also, also true for a lot of occupations where it's basically self-employed people, it's basically on-demand jobs that basically we have now. That also means that we have changing employment patterns uh, where people have less security, um, less benefits, uh, more insecurity in the job arrangements uh, that we have currently. The fifth one is about neglected occupational disease, and I will come back to that. Um, we, of course, all suffer from the fact that we search under the lamppost, and we might actually forget about other things that deserve attention that we haven't really recognized, and, and one of those is chronic kidney disease that uh, we have very poorly understood, but very much understudied. Um, the sixth research need uh, comes back to um, the idea that we really need to have very good research infrastructures uh, where we actually can have early detection systems for the occurrence of occupational disease or for the occupational potential occupational risk factors. And one of those is modern net, um, one of the cost actions that, that tries to do that, uh, but we don't really have good systems in place. So give me a little bit more detail about the different things. So when we think about climate change, we tend to think directly about the fact that, of course, that changes the heat profile of some of the jobs, and that leads basically to heat stress and associated um, health effects. And that is true, and that's one of the, the areas that is of, of, of interest. But it goes much beyond um, the direct input, uh, the direct effect of, of climate change and, and temperature. It basically also means that we get ex changing exposure patterns. Um, if agricultural practices change, that means that different allergens, different products are being produced in different parts of the world, and basically different populations get in contact with something that they haven't been before. Um, agricultural practices may change, and that means basically different pesticides uh, being used um, in different parts of, uh, of the world. So, when we move on to the second one, which is basically the key enabling technologies and the Green Deal, um, we basically in the Green Deal have determined that we try to get to zero pollution and there's a lot of key enabling technologies that would basically try to foster new materials, new manufacturing uh, ways of, of producing uh, products. 
Uh, and that also has its impact on the people that actually are involved in these production processes, and we have to understand what that means. Especially when we think about circular economy, it means basically the reuse of materials, and the reuse of materials will mean that we actually get new exposures that we didn't recognize before. Um, just an example in this picture is basically uh, the recycling of plastic, uh, and that basically brings back potential issues into the workplace that um, we need to understand. And so um, when we actually um, move to a new solution, it basically means that we have to get to integrated risk assessment with the implementation of sustainable technologies or try to get to green chemistry. So when we think about the aging workforce, and so I'm just going to show you a little bit of a rendering with the European population from the 1990s till the projected 2050 and see basically this pyramid basically going up and becoming basically a rectangular block. Um, and that means basically that we have an aging population and that means that on average the working population uh, will be at a higher age, but it also means that we are now of course in all countries uh, discussing the prolonged working life that we actually will work longer. And the real questions, if you think from occupational health uh, side, is who are the people that actually will be able to work till the age of 67 or beyond, especially when you think about physically demanding jobs um, and so on. It's also that we actually might increase health inequalities because people that have a general poorer health will be much more challenged to actually um, get a prolonged working life and keep on being active till, till that age where that actually might be different for people in good health. So these are things that we really have to understand and study to make sure that um, we optimize occupational health. Wanted also to talk about basically, of course, the changing um, um, societies and that is basically that we have a 24-hour society um, and that also means that in a 24-hour society um, that jobs basically also have to be available or at least um, there around the job for, for certain aspects of, of, of goods and services that we want to deliver. This was a slide that Annette Peters already showed this morning about the, population, uh, the proportion of uh, the population exposed to long working hours, more than 55 hours a week. Um, of course, you can see here that um, while we are talking now about a European research agenda, we always have to recognize, especially in environment and in occupation, that a lot of the issues that we have here, we have often um, transported to other parts of, of the globe. And you can see here really that, of course, um, the issues that we have on exposures, but also on, on working hours, is, is really uh, affecting heavily the global south, uh, but also the, the global north, and we have to understand what that means. When we think about uh, prolonged hours, um, one of those issues is, is really um, shift work that has been high on the agenda for a long time. There are certain things that we understand of shift work, if you think about cardiovascular disease, uh, but there are still um, huge uh, questions about cardiovascular disease, about mental health, neurological diseases, and so on, what basically it does when we actually start to live outside, basically, the, our biological rhythms. And this we really need to understand. Um, now, shift work, and I've, I've been involved in shift work, and, and, and um, it's, it's quite a difficult area, because this is one of those areas where um, environment and occupation, lifestyle all comes together, and that actually might require a more holistic or exposome approach. And I'm just putting this slide up, not, not to go into to detail, but if you just think about what shift work does, it actually means that you guide effects on your social patterns, your interactions with your family, uh, basically change uh, with your friends, so it has that social cohesion um, aspect. Uh, lifestyle changes, we, we know that um, among shift workers, uh, especially during shift works, there is a tendency to go for more unhealthy, high caloric food just to get through the night. Um, we see that there are disturbed sleep patterns, uh, Disturbed sleep is one of those issues which I think just in environmental health itself is a huge issue that we have to understand more. Uh, it leads to disturbed eating patterns, not so much what you eat, but basically the timing of when you eat compared to your biological clock is hugely important, how your biological 
function actually deals with the, the insults and, and with the dietary components. Um, and there is light exposure in itself, which uh, can have its uh, effects on basically uh, melatonin suppression and other uh, aspects. So this is where you can see that when we get into these more complex settings of occupations, we have to basically broaden our view than basically on, on a single factor. Um, just wanted to talk briefly about uh, the research need that we saw on changing employment patterns, basically precarious uh, and non-standard employment. Uh, a larger part of the population is basically now dealing with a more non-standard employment arrangement, uh, which can be gig jobs, um, can be part-time jobs, um, can be basically self-employed, um, and this leads to perhaps at sometimes more freedom, but often comes with a lot of insecurities, and that affects um, different parts of the, the population. So um, low-educated um, immigrants, uh, women, might actually be more affected by these um, different job arrangements than others, and that's something that we have to understand um, what that is. The, so societal, societal changes uh, following the COVID-19 pandemic uh, basically has stressed the complexity also of work-life balance. We all know that we actually have been working from home, uh, many of you, for a long time, and that actually has blurred completely um, your home environment with your work environment, and that has actually led to um, all kinds of, of problems, uh, especially on the, the mental health side. This also basically can lead to uh, increased uh, gender uh, in inequalities. And this is uh, from uh, a study in, on The Lancet that basically showed the impact uh, by gender of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in 2020-2021, um, where you can see that uh, women were more likely to suffer from employment loss. Um, that, um, the uh, foregoing work for the care of others basically was much more um, towards uh, women than it was to, to men. Um, and women and girls were more likely to drop, drop out from schools and education programs. Um, so we can see that societal changes, environmental changes can really affect um, occupational circumstances and therefore basically also societal um, aspects and health. Just to go back to what I said before about the neglected occupational disease, we, um, if we look at, and this is just a picture of uh, the burden of disease in the, in the Netherlands, which is quite common and, and comparable to um, other uh, Western European countries uh, with cancer, cardiovascular disease, and uh, musculoskeletal um, disease and mental disorders as, as large disease entities of importance. And we do have basically a lot of evidence uh, on occupational risk factors for cancer, for cardiovascular, but if we look at mental disorders, that's really an area where we still have much more to do. Uh, but to come back to CKD um, and kidney, um, that would be up there. So there's a lot of smaller disease entities that we really haven't addressed, uh, but together could be very important. But even if you take these large diseases like cancer or cardiovascular disease, you see these small bubbles going off, uh, right? That those are the more rare cancers that we also haven't studied um, to the full extent. And so this is really where, again, research infrastructures being able to put large studies together so that we actually recognize the impact on diseases that are not that high prevalent in the population is hugely important because together, of course, uh, they can still have a large impact on population health. So with that, I'm just moving forward. Um, I've gone in this um, short presentation through the six research needs that we have articulated in the report uh, that we really think is important to take uh, forward. I, I did uh, put in a, uh, a mentee at the, this end, and um, when, when I did it, I, I, I realized that perhaps I shouldn't have done it, but now it's up, so I cannot go back. Yeah. Um, because the question that I wanted to ask you was, um, it's not a competition between the research needs, but I think it would be useful for starting the discussion 
to get your initial feedback when you think about these six ones where you feel that this is something really that we need to address. So it is a kind of a prioritization exercise. So if you go to menti.com and use the code 4232 Yeah, let's, let's do that, and then I'll go back to uh, show the results, if, if I can find it. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I, um, but it's back. Sorry. So I have one com comment while people are hopefully doing this, which is just I'm really um, glad to hear you talking about shift work and, and that. But it's more than that. We hear about light at night. But light is a problem all the time, not only light at night, but the excess light, that there's very little darkness in the world. I mean, unless, you know, maybe at the bottom of the Grand Canyon or something <laughs> comparable. Yeah. Um, and, and there are physiological consequences of that and that I don't think should be in, uh, ignored. You know, we talked about the importance of noise, but I think we also need to talk about light. Yeah, and if you look at the research uh, goals that Annette presented uh, this morning, light at night was uh, one of those topics that, that was in there. Um, so I think that it is important uh, from an environmental standpoint. Um, shift work is just basically an extreme example of light at night in, in certain circumstances. Sorry, what about the light from all the monitors and stuff? Yeah, that's uh, that's a, a good question, and, and Anke Hoos can probably answer that uh, that better um, than I. So there, there is, of course, light from all the screens that we have. We tend to use them also very shortly before we go to sleep. Um, that certainly has its impacts on um, sleep uh, quality. Um, the question, though, there scientifically is is that it um, has to do with arousal of you still being active. Therefore, it takes more time to get to sleep. Is it because of the light from the screen um, or is it simply a displacement um, question? So that's basically one of these areas that um, is active at the moment to understand basically what, what of that use it really is. Do you know the answer? Oh, do I know the answer? <laughs> um, well, I don't know the answer, of course, but the, uh, I, can, I can look it up, I hope except that the Mac is um, crashing because the, um, the bar doesn't come up anymore. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. You got it to work. Okay. Are there any other questions, comments? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah I ju I, while you're doing that, I just had a comment about insecure and badly paid work, which I think actually binds together a lot of different problems. Um, in the UK, initially with COVID, there were incredibly high death rates from people like taxi drivers, bus drivers, unskilled manual workers. But when we adjusted for living conditions, it almost completely went away. And it's not that they're not occupational, it's just if you're an insecure, badly paid job, you're gonna be in crowded living conditions at home you're not going to be able to take time off, um, you're not going to be able to isolate. And so I think one reason the UK did so appallingly badly with COVID was actually because of the nature of work as, and the living conditions that go with that. And you can see that binds in with a lot of other things, that if you're in that sort of job, you're going to take more risks as a bicycle courier, you're going to take more risks at work, you're, not going, to, you're going to turn up when you're sick and so on. No, I, I fully agree with you, uh, Neil, and that, that's what I try to to articulate in, in when I was starting about the fact that this div division between environment and, and occupation, that doesn't make sense because they're intimately connected, as you point out. So oh. what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, um, well, it, it seems um, that if you're a, a very fast counter, you could do this, but um, I, I think it's not summarizing. Uh, the results, I think this is just basically showing what everybody's answering. Um, and I cannot count on the fly. So um, I, we'll, we'll have to bring that back to you, I, I'm afraid. Uh, that was a question here, Paolo. 
<coughs> what are your, your views about the stress? Because I think it has been a little neglected by epidemiological research. And also, uh, for example, the, the Karasek model uh, has, is different uh, probably uh, in different uh, um, areas of, of work, of jobs. And I, I'm not aware of, of much research, particularly about the new uh, jobs, the gig economy. Yeah. So um, I, I think you're, you're right, uh, Paolo. Um, the research priority that we set basically on precarious jobs uh, and non-standard jobs has to do with work arrangement, but it has to do basically also with insecurity, insecurity, stress-related access. So I think that's one of the, the topics to, uh, to, to focus on, um, and it's an important one. Thank you. I think we should probably move yep. on because I think we're way behind.